we might go ahead and get started if, if we could. Um, let, thank you all for braving the weather um, and coming in tonight. Uh, we may have one or two more coming in. I think the, actually the subscription is, uh, will fill the house. So hopefully the weather will cooperate and we'll get you all in here. Uh, my name is Philip Mills, and it's my honor to serve on the board of the uh, Foreign Policy Association. And tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Rashid Khalidi. Professor Khalidi has been pro a prolific contributor to the long de longstanding discussion of the issues faced by the Palestinian people. His latest book, The Iron Cage, The Story of the Palestinian Struggle for Statehood, went to press during the crisis in Lebanon this past summer. This book is his seventh book on the subject of Middle Eastern issues, focusing on the Palestinian situation in particular. In addition to these books, Professor Khalidi has published over 75 scholarly articles on Middle Eastern history and politics, and I understand uh, among several sessions that he has done related to his book is a session on Pete Rose that um, I would encourage you. Charlie Rose, Charlie Rose sorry. Uh, <laughs> Charlie Rose. It's an important distinction. He, he doesn't, but he's working on it. Um, so I, we don't have a date for that, but I, as PBS viewers, I would encourage you all to look out for the Charlie Rose session. Uh, Pref, Professor Khalidi currently teaches at Columbia University, has previously taught at the University of Chicago, Lebanese University, the American University of Beirut, and Georgetown. He also served as an advisor to the Palestinian delega delegation in the early 90s for the Madrid and Washington Arab-Israeli peace negotiations. Let me remind you that our purpose at the FBA is to foster an open discussion and understanding of the myriad perspectives surrounding foreign policy. We do not advance an agenda on any particular subject beyond our core mission of education and discussion. As I often like to say in explaining our goal to my friends, our goal is to connect the dots between foreign policy and Main Street. Regrettably, it takes tragic events like those of 9-11 to make those connections obvious to many in Main Street, and if I may say so, uh, some of the policy makers in our government, both Republican and Democratic alike. Where one comes out on these issues is entirely yours, not ours, to decide. Our purpose is to contribute to your understanding uh, on those issues. Why do I go out of my way to stress this point? Obviously, tonight's subject, the subject of the Palestine and the Palestinian people, is a highly sensitive subject in our society. Frankly, it is a subject the mere discussion of which runs the risk of one being misunderstood or mischaracterized as anti-Semitic. It is for this reason that the issue is unfortunately perceived as the third rail in politics. However, it is very much in our national interest to confront this issue with the utmost intellectual honesty divorced from politics and faith. I would point out that some of the most outspoken in calling for a fair hearing on the treatment of the Palestinian question and the Palestinian people are the thought leaders in the Jewish community, and I applaud them for their leadership in that regard. In the view of many, the chronic failure of the United States to play a balanced role in the matters affecting the Palestinian situation has profoundly contributed to one of the most important foreign policy challenges we in the United States face in the 21st century, probably second if not equal to the challenges presented and to be presented by the rise of economic power in the Asian nations. The Palestinian situation has been a significant, unresolved foreign policy issue since at least the First World War. Furthermore, it continues to be at the front of foreign policy in the early stages of the 20th century. Arguably, the Palestinian situation is more important than the threats imposed by the nuclear activities of North Korea. It is certainly a significant contributing factor to the increasing threats to the interests of the United States and Western countries alike from Iran. Indeed, as one thinks about what could possibly motivate people to commit the atrocities of 9-11, unless we forget it, related incidents in Madrid, London, and Bali. Among the possible explanations for those actions must be the outrage at the unfairness of the treatment of the Palestinian people. That is in no way intended to validate or condone the activities of those responsible for those acts. It is simply an observation that I, like many, have found unsatisfactory uh, 
in explanations we have been given, like they hate us or they hate our way of life. There may be more to this than that, and perhaps a feeling that the Palestinian situation is an important component of that anger. So I challenge you tonight, the intellectual, the interested, and the engaged, to leave behind whatever biases you may have and help raise the debate to a discussion on the merits, to take the discussion beyond the four walls of this room into the open in the hope that through the collective efforts of the intellectually honest here and elsewhere, we can enhance the consideration of the issues and possible solutions to the Palestinian situation. To state the obvious, there are many more questions than answers. To help us think more clearly about those questions, we're pleased to host Professor Khalidi tonight. Following his remarks, there will be an opportunity for questions, and I would encourage you to challenge Professor Khalidi with your questions and your observations. Afterwards, Professor Khalidi will also be available to sign copies of his book uh, as part of the reception. Please join me in welcoming Professor Khalidi. Thank you all for coming out on this miserable evening. Um, I had to come in a way. You didn't have to come. So. <laughs> um, my topic is the topic of my book, The Iron Cage, um, the story of the Palestinian struggle for statehood. That's the title. Um, and my ambition, of course, is to be invited one day onto a, a, a Pete Rose show. <laughs> or I'm asked questions about baseball rather than questions about Middle East history and politics. But for the moment, I'm condemned to talk about Middle East history, which I'm happy to do, especially before an audience like this one. Um, the questions that I try and answer in this book um, came to me well over 10 years ago uh, as I was finishing an earlier book entitled uh, Palestinian Identity. In that book, which I think was published in 96 or 97, I showed that Palestinian national identity came together in the first uh, quarter of the 20th century. As I was completing it during the early 1990s, at a time when I was also serving uh, as, as an advisor to the Palestinian delegation to the peace talks in Madrid and Washington and teaching and so forth, I was left with the question of why, if the Palestinians had developed a reasonably well-defined national identity in the first quarter of the 20th century, they were so unsuccessful in the following 75 years in turning that identity into a state. I mean, we always assume that national groups that develop a strong national identity, identity eventually uh, achieve statehood, independence, self-determination. Why did this not happen in the Palestinian case? Um, and so this started me off on the process, which led to my writing this book. Um, I thought I was on the point of finishing this book uh, during a sabbatical I had planned for 2001-2002. I had arranged to go to Aix-en-Provence, which is a hardship post for those of you who haven't been there. Um, but it's a good place to work on the kinds of things I work on. It has an extraordinarily good uh, collection of Middle East specialists and a wonderful library and archives and so on and so forth. And the food's not bad and the weather's okay. So I, I, was, ver I was looking forward to this very much after many, many years when I had not taken a sabbatical at the University of Chicago where I was then teaching. Um, Events intervened, however, uh, in the form of 9-11, the war in Afghanistan, and in particular, the planning that everybody could see for a war in Iraq. Um, as, 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 as the Bush administration's main response to the atrocity of 9-11. I was horrified by this. I'm a Middle East historian by training. My work has dealt with Western intervention in the Middle East and nationalism in the Middle East from the time I started out as a graduate student in the early 70s. And I could see the catastrophe that was coming. And so, in effect, what happened in 9-11 and in the aftermath of 9-11 forced me to stop working on this book and to write another book called Resurrecting Empire, Western Footprints and America's Perilous Path in the Middle East. The subtitle was my editor's, by the way, um, in which I, I tried uh, to warn against the folly of the Iraq war. Um, and I, I wrote that. And after I finished it, I went back and finished this book. Um, now, when I finished this book, um, the situation was entirely different than the time, uh, the, than the moment when these questions first came to me in the early 90s. In the early 90s, it looked like a peace was at hand in the Middle East. In the early 90s, it looked like there might be a Palestinian state. Um, 
the Madrid and, and Washington negotiations and later the Oslo Accords signed on the White House lawn, the creation of the Palestinian Authority, the, 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 the negotiation of an Israeli-Jordanian uh, peace treaty, the, the, the Syrians and the Israelis coming this close twice to peace treaties in the mid-90s and again in 2000 made people think that this conflict was on the way to resolution and that a Palestinian state would come about. Obviously, none of these things have proven to be true. The Iron Cage examines first the failure of the Palestinians to establish an independent state before 1948, which of course is the year of Israel's founding, but is also the year of the dissolution of Arab Palestine. In that year, Arabs formed an overwhelming majority, about 60 odd percent, maybe 64, 65 percent of the population of Palestine. And secondly, it examines the impact of that failure in the years that followed. Um, I was originally really going to write about the period up to 1948. My editor, a very, a very smart woman, much smarter than me, said, you've got to bring this story up to the present. So about a third of the book brings the story, as much as I can, up to the present. Um, a topic like this, why did the Palestinians fail to develop a state, provokes a sequence of questions that I think are, relate as much to the present as, as they relate to the past. What purpose is served by such a study when, after six decades, or nearly six decades, after 1948, an independent Palestinian state in any real sense of the word independent not only does not exist, but when its establishment doesn't look at all likely in the foreseeable future. Why work on this when it's not something that's very likely? Um, anybody who, who's paid attention to events in the region knows that the obstacles to independent Palestinian statehood only grew after the elections to the Palestinian Legislative Council were won by Hamas back in January of this year, and after the United States, Europe, and Israel imposed a financial siege on the, on the Palestinian Authority, which has basically led to, the, to, to, to a serious degrading of, the, uh, of, the, of not, just, not just mechanisms of state, but of the entire public sector uh, serving all services, education, health, and so on and so forth. So what there was of a state is, is gradually being destroyed under this financial siege. Um, the obstacles grew further after violence escalated in the Gaza Strip and Lebanon uh, over the spring and summer of this year. In the case of Gaza, that violence continues until today. Uh, during the six months during which this has been going on, uh, over 300 people uh, in the Gaza Strip, most of them civilians and 60 of them children, have been killed and many hundreds have been wounded. This is the most heavily populated area on Earth. And what we're talking about is the use of weapons that are essentially designed to fight wars against other armies are being used in this heavily built up area. Two Israeli civilians have been killed by Palestinian rockets fired from the Gaza Strip, and there's been a lot of damage also, and some people wounded. But there's been a huge casualty toll in Gaza. So I think all of these things show um, that, this, that, that uh, obstacles to Palestinian statehood, if anything, are even worse today than they were even a year ago. Now, this book is not about the entirety of the Arab-Israeli or the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It is rather about specifically about the Palestinian component uh, of those conflicts, um, and, 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 and more narrowly about the unsuccessful efforts so far, at least, of the Palestinians to achieve independence in their homeland. Um, I think that if you look carefully at how this war started this summer, the war around Lebanon, you can see how intimately these things are linked, Palestine and other things, Palestine, Israel, and other things. You will recall, perhaps, that when Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah uh, launched What's, what ended up being a major Lebanese-Israeli war, he claimed by kidnapping, capturing these two Israeli soldiers in, on the 12th of July. He claimed, whether this is true or not is not the point, he claimed that this was meant to help relieve Israeli pressure on Gaza. So these things are linked, and we, we know that many people, including people in Washington, people in Israel, people in Iran, saw this summer's war as sort of a proxy American-Iranian uh, conflict. Um, I think that... I think that um, what has happened over the past summer uh, indicates again the crucial importance of a careful rereading of recent Palestinian history uh, and of the history of the different actors in this region if you're going to un attain an understanding of the overall conflict. There are people who are specialists in terror or terrorism. I call them terrorologists. Generally speaking, they don't know the languages of, say, uh, the Tamils and, and they don't know the languages of, say, uh, uh, the people who carry out terrorism in Pakistan or in pa Palestine or wherever it may be. They know nothing about culture. They know nothing about history. Um, they're experts in terror. Um, similarly, there are conflict resolution specialists who often don't know very much about the, the specifics of the people engaged in these conflicts. And I have 
you know, great respect for some people who write about terrorism and great respect for some people who deal, uh, deal with conflict resolution. But I would argue that you can't figure out anything about the resolution of a conflict if you don't know a great deal of history. Uh, and I think that this is a perfect case of how uh, uh, our understanding has been obscured by the absence of, su of sufficient attention to history. I think that in our country, we in particular are the victims of what I would call a one-dimensional and a historical approach to the entire conflict, uh, which is almost entirely, at least by our politicians, seen in terms of the prism of terrorism. The president, again, today, for example, in talking about uh, some foreign policy issues in the Middle East, constantly recurred to the term terror and terrorism, which of course is important. But if you see everything solely through that prism, I think you miss a great deal. And I think it obscures thoroughly the specificity of all the various actors, whether the Palestinians or other, other actors. And it, it is by, 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 its, by its nature that, that a historical prism, um, faulty, flawed. Now, I, I obviously understand that the Palestinian quest for independence, which is my subject in this book, is only one of, ele of the many elements that have to be grasped if we're going to understand the causes of this conflict. But because any half-decent historian will tell you that for nearly a century this Palestinian effort has been so central to events in the region, in the Arab world in particular, but also as between the Arabs and the Israelis, um, willfully ignoring it, which many people do, there's very little attention, I think, paid to it, leads directly to the kind of reductive, partial, and misguided American official thinking that I would argue has produced, in some measure, the problems that afflict this region. Now, I am not one of those people who don't think that people in the region have no responsibility for what they do. They have a great deal of responsibility. And one of the key arguments of this book is to look at Palestinian responsibility. But I stress the word produce these conflicts because I also strongly believe that whether we're talking about the United States or Great Britain in an earlier period, whether we're talking about the United Nations or the League of Nations in an earlier period, these are actors that have played important roles in creating these problems. And I, 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 I want to make this a relatively brief talk so we have time for questions. I'd be happy to come back to this um, in the question and answer period. Now, as I pointed out, the, the Palestinian Authority and the West Bank and the Gaza Strip today seems to be tottering in the wake of the elections in January, in the wake of the response by the international community, and in the wake also, very importantly, of the failure of Fatah and Hamas, the two leading Palestinian factions, to agree on a coalition government that might relieve the suffering that's being caused by this international boycott. In any case, the state that the Palestinians never had and that many expected would emerge in the 90s uh, seems as far away as ever. And what this book does is to try and look at the historical roots of that failure. Now, I'm sometimes asked by a different kind of audience than this one. Uh, I've spoken on this book a, a lot. My, my publisher is active in sending me out on a book tour, which ends in Houston and Chicago this week, and I can't wait for it to be over, <laughs> though I will see my daughter in Chicago, so that's the good news. Um, I'm, asked, I would, I, I'm often asked in a different kind of audience than this one, specifically audiences that have a large number of Arab Americans or Arabs, why I focus on the role of the Palestinians in their past failures and, or in their past defeats when they have been consistently the weakest of the parties that were involved in this struggle to determine the fate of Palestine, whether before 1948 or of Palestine and Israel since 1948. Before 48, obviously, these parties included the British Empire, the greatest power of its day, which was consistent in opposing Palestinian aspirations for statehood. Uh, it, it, it shifted its position on Zionism, Britain did, but it never shifted its position in ferociously opposing Palestinian statehood. Um, you know about the other actors, the United States, the Soviet Union, both of them voted uh, uh, for partition of Palestine into an Arab and a Jewish state. Both of them immediately recognized the state of Israel. Neither of them, nor did any other country in the international community, do anything to prevent the, the strangling of the embryonic Arab state that was supposed to emerge in Palestine as well in 1948. Um, there are other actors, obviously. There's the Zionist movement. There are the Arab states. I could go into all of them. But in, in, in any case, all of these actors were more powerful than were the Palestinians. To rephrase that question that I'm sometimes, uh, sometimes asked in light of these facts, um, why do you concentrate on the failures or incapacities of the Palestinians to achieve independence before 48 or since 48 when the forces against them are so powerful and have always proven overwhelming? 
Why don't you focus on external forces that played a predominant role in preventing the Palestinians from achieving self-determination? And I have to say, I do focus on those external forces. The title of the book, The Iron Cage, is a reference to the constraints that the British imposed on the Palestinians during the mandate. And if you're interested, I can talk about that again, exactly how this was done by the British uh, in response to questions. But let me go on, because people have criticized this approach from a different direction. What I've just given you is the critique I've gotten from Arab American audiences. For example, when I talked at the University of Michigan in Dearborn, which is the largest Arab city outside the Arab world, um, for your information, it is, a, it is a big center of Arab Americans. Uh, from a different perspective, other people have argued that the Palestinians or Palestinian leaders should bear the entire responsibility for their own failures, and some go even further and blame the victim, the Palestinians, entirely for the tragic history of the Palestinian people and often for everything that happened in the region to everybody else. Um, now, I would suggest that in light of the responsibilities of other parties in this story, to start with the international community alone, there are major actors that obviously bear some share of responsibility here. It's clear what the benefits of blaming the victim are. We come off scot-free, we the United States or the British or whoever. Now, finally, other people have argued, and this is my own approach, that even if the Palestinians cannot be fully blamed for all their misfortunes, and even if the balance of forces against them, which was almost always unfavorable, has to be taken into account, um, they nonetheless are accountable for their own actions and decisions. And this is the approach I take in this book. Um, whether an external forces or internal Palestinian weaknesses or as I believe a combination of both of them, prevented the establishment of an independent Palestinian state, all of, this lead, all of this leaves us, in my view, with another important question. Is statehood the destined outcome for a people who, even though they've developed a, a, a strong sense of national identity, have been unable to develop lasting, viable forms, structural forms, for this identity, or to control a national territory in which this identity can, you know, flower and, and take shape. The fate of the Armenians for most of the 20th century and the ongoing fate of the Kurds shows that this is a possible outcome. Uh, being left, in a sense, in a stateless limbo could be what faces the Palestinians for the foreseeable future. Now, I think all of these questions that I've asked in this book are important for three reasons. I'll try and go through them fairly quickly. The first is because I think Palestinian history has to be properly understood if we're going to under, understand, comprehend the Palestinian present, or if we're going to understand the history and the present circumstances of other peoples, including the Israelis. You cannot understand Israeli history. You cannot understand the problems Israel faces if you do not understand Palestinian history. The Zionist enterprise came to Palestine, a country which was almost entirely inhabited by Arabs. Uh, when the first settlements are established in the 1870s and 80s, the overwhelming population, a uh, majority of the population, is Arab. You have to understand the evolution of that society in order to understand how Israeli society evolved. The same is true for understanding neighboring peoples and understanding regional events. Um, but it's also important because this history, Palestinian history, has significance in its own right. It's a subject of its own. Um, it, it happens to be the case that in the West, Palestinian history is a sort of hidden history. It's obscured by the riveting and tragic narrative of modern Jewish history. In a sense, and, and this is particularly true in the United States, the history of the Palestinians has sort of disappeared, or at least been, been obscured, under the powerful impact of the painful uh, story of the catastrophic fate of the Jews in, in Europe in the mid-20th century. Um, now, this is a particularly American problem. In recent years, the Palestinian issue has moved people all over the world who have been capable of looking at both narratives simultaneously. Uh, many people in the United States appear incapable of doing this. I would argue that understanding anything about the Middle East requires comprehending Palestinian history in particular because of its centrality to so many other things on in its own terms. And this includes but cannot be subsumed by history of other peoples, whether Israelis or, or other Arab peoples. So that's the first reason I think that this is important. The second reason is that I think it's necessary to ascribe agency to the Palestinians. It's necessary to avoid seeing them as no more than helpless victims of forces greater than themselves, which is a, a particularly Palestinian trope, a Palestinian way of seeing their own history. 
And similarly, it's necessary to avoid seeing them as driven solely by self-destructive tendencies and uncontrollable dissension. Now, the Palestinians face uphill odds from the beginning of their modern history. They still do. Palestinian society and politics were and are divided and faction-ridden, no more than no more so than today. And, and they are divided in ways that give hostile forces and gave hostile forces many cleavages to exploit. But it's my argument in this book, and I think it's definitely true, that the Palestinians had many assets, they were far from helpless, and they often faced a range of choices, some of which were better or at least less bad than others. In this book, I focus on the 20s and the 30s and the eight 1980s and 90s as times when I think there were choices uh, which I think should be very carefully examined. Um, and where, you know, uh, I, I think you can, one can be very critical. That's the second reason I think this is important. The third, that these questions are important. The third reason is that I think the case of Palestine illustrates strikingly the long-term perils of great powers following short-sighted policies that are not based on their own professed principles, principles like self-determination, and democracy, and that are not consonant with international law and legitimacy. I would argue this was just as true during the many decades when Britain dominated the Middle East as it has been of the half century since then when our country has been the preeminent power in the Middle East. We have dominated the Middle East since American soldiers landed in North Africa in 1943. We have been the preeminent power. We eclipsed the British and the French. We were much stronger than the Soviets, even when we didn't realize it and other powers didn't realize it. But in fact, if looking back on that history, you can see that it has been the case that since the 40s, the United States has been the preeminent power in that region. And I would argue that uh, you have to look very carefully to see American, or for that matter, British attention to what both countries claimed were the principles that, 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 that animated them. Now, this book attempts to deal with all of these issues in a fresh way. But it's not what I would call a revisionist history, along the lines of the kinds of books that have emerged from the Israeli Academy in recent years. Revi revisionist history, properly, properly described, requires as a foil an established authoritative master narrative that's fundamentally flawed in some way. Generally, it requires, such a narrative requires a state to propagate it via school system, universities, research institutes, national archives, museums, statues, postage stamps, holidays, and so on and so forth, all the other tools at the disposal of a state. I mean, think of Bunker Hill, think of Mount Vernon, think of anything that's in the Liberty Bell, and you'll see the, the, the way, and think of how, how important American history is in our curriculums in school. I mean, I teach in a history department at Columbia where fully a third of the faculty, and it was the same as true at Chicago, fully a third of the faculty teach American history. Another third teach European history, and less than a third teach the history of all the rest of the world. As we put it, those of us who have the most history to teach have the fewest people to teach it, um, which is not a, uh, obviously not a disparaging uh, reflection on American history. It's our national history. But that's, that's, that's the way in which an authoritative master narrative emerges when you have a, a country that focuses on its own national history. It's normal. It's natural. And it necessarily leads to revisionism. Um, so in the case of Israel, you've had a number of historians known in Israel as the new historians, including people like Tom Segev, uh, Avi Shleim, Benny Morris, Ilan Pape. There are a few others who argue against the nationalist mythology of their own country as that mythology has shaped Israeli accounts of, of their own country's history, basing themselves on the archives. They've gone to the archives and they've discovered that what they learned in school basically wasn't in large measure true about this or that specific event or, 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 or period. Uh, these, the, the accounts that, 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 they have, that they have demolished uh, became the backbone of the way in which Israel's history and the whole conflict, in fact, was understand, understood in the United States. And so while in Israel these guys have knocked down some you know, hollow statues, most of those ideas are still prevalent in this country. I could talk about some of these myths that they've, that they've dismantled, but I'm going to skip that. Um, by contrast, looking at the Palestinian case, there is no established authoritative Palestinian master narrative, essentially because there's no Palestinian state to propagate such a narrative. There are no Palestinian national archives. There's no national library or museum. There are, in fact, no functioning research universities in Palestine. Um, there are eight universities that struggle simply to teach, but they do not have the facilities to provide the, the, kind, of, the kind of environment that's necessary for, for faculty to do serious research. Um, there is, of course, a Palestinian nationalist narrative which includes its share of myths. 
among the myths that I think are worth debunking in the Palestinian narrative um, are mistaken ideas uh, relating to the connection between the Zionist movement in Israel on the one hand and the Western powers on the other. Uh, among them also is the question of the relation of Zionism to the course of modern Jewish history, notably a, a failure on the part of many Palestinians to appreciate the central place of the rise to power of the Nazis and of the Holocaust in both Jewish history and the history of Zionism and in Palestinian history. And I can talk about this later. I mean, one of the crucial breakpoints in Palestinian history is the rise to power of Hitler. It takes place in Europe. It has nothing to do ostensibly with the Middle East or the Arabs or the Palestinians, but it, it is a crucial breakpoint in Palestinian history. It's a watershed. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand anything about Palestinian history. And so many, many Palestinians or many writers on Palestinian history who haven't given this sufficient importance, um, uh, in, in effect, uh, uh, fall into terrible traps. Finally, there is a reductionist view of Zionism as no more than a colonial enterprise. Now, I, I must hasten to say that if you actually go to the West Bank and look at the way in which the settlement enterprise operates, there's no question but that it is colonial. There's no other way to describe it. Um, what Palestinians fail to understand, however, is that Zionism, while it was operating in this colonial fashion at their expense, was also serving as the national movement of a people developed into a, who developed into a nation state. The fact that it was being constructed at their expense maybe blinded them to this fact. Um, in fact, there's no reason why both of these positions cannot be true, that Zionism is a national movement and the way in which Zionism and Israel have operated vis-a-vis -vis the indigenous Palestinian inhabitants of the country is in fact colonial. There are multiple examples of national movements and of nations and of important nation states, including our own, that were colonial in their origins, in the way in which they, Australia for that matter, in the way in which they behaved towards their indigenous peoples. Um, I think that what the Israeli historians have done and what I think could be done in terms of the Palestinian national narrative in the way of this deconstructing such misconceived notions on both sides will be crucially important to an eventual reconciliation between Palestinians and Israelis whenever a settlement of this conflict can be achieved. And I, 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 I specifically say after a resolution of the conflict, I don't think we're going to have resolution, I don't think we're going to have reconciliation before there's a resolution of this conflict. The Germans and the French, who fought th several of the most hideous wars in modern in human history, uh, uh, leading up to World Wars I and II, but there was the Franco-Prussian War, there were wars before that, um, had huge animosity between them. Uh, and we today have the spectacle of French and German historians jointly writing textbooks for French and German high school students to better understand the relationship between France and Germany. You couldn't have done that in the 30s or the 20s or the 1880s. It would have been impossible. You had to have a settlement of the disputes between them you had to have a resolution of the conflict between them, political resolution, whether the Germans were happy with it at the time or the French were happy with it at the time, and then it was possible to have reconciliation. So whenever there is a, settle a settlement, you could have a reconciliation based on the deconstruction of these kind of mis misconceived notions I've talked about. Let me conclude. I would argue that in spite of the absence of a Palestinian national archive, and in spite of the loss or dispersal since 1948 of much of the basic source material for Palestinian history, the sources do exist for historians to ask why the Palestinians were not more successful in their quest for independence before 48 and since 1948, and specifically why they failed to create viable state structures in all of this time. I think that in the past, some people have asked these questions and have answered them in ways that are too glib and that are sometimes unfair to the actors involved. Uh, it's a tall order to explain why something did not happen. It's a much taller order. It's even harder when much of the evidence has been scattered by the events you're trying to explain. But I do think it can be done, and that if it is done, it will illuminate not just the history of the Palestinians, but the history of others. I think that everybody in that region, in fact, uh, uh, has history that can, in fact, only be understood if we can elucidate this, and vice versa. Um, I don't think these are minor matters. I don't think these are arcane issues that, you know, need only concern academics. They're not academic issues, frankly. Uh, I think they're serious issues. They're political issues. They are relevant issues to our current situation. We are reviled in large part in the Arab and Islamic world by people who do not reject our values and who would never dream of engaging in terrorism in large measure because of our policy on Palestine. Otherwise well-intentioned people 
who do not dislike us as, as a people or a culture. They love our, our, our values. They love our econ economic system. They love Disneyland. They love McDonald's, but they don't like our Middle East policy. And so this, these are relevant issues. Understanding all of this history, I think, is not academic or arcane. I think in narrower terms, it's essential to our understanding of whether the Palestinians can today create effective structures of state or create some other framework for their national existence in the face of very strong opposition. Uh, and, and answering that question will help to determine whether the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip, which I would remind you have been occupied now for nearly 40 years, uh, this is two generations of people who've lived under military occupation. This is more than two-thirds of the life of the Israeli state. Um, whether the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip and other areas where Palestinians live will continue to live in instability and distress. These are regions that are tormented, as obviously as Israel, but the Palestinians in particular, uh, uh, wherever they are, um, face enormous problems. Uh, I think that if that question can be answered in a positive fashion, it will help to determine whether the Palestinians and their neighbors, both Arab and Israelis, will finally be able to enjoy peace and stability after nearly 60 years of suffering. Thank you very much. I stay here or sit down? Okay. Questions? Dr. Khalidi, I trust you will allow me to... Oh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Khalidi, I trust you will permit me to take a somewhat contrary point of view to what you're saying. There's no question that the, uh, the hopes of a peaceful settlement and a fair one are very low when events are uh, led by history. And um, uh, in my opinion, that uh, if there is to be a settlement between Israel and the Palestinians, not the rest of the area, mm -hmm. it has got to be between uh, those two countries or potential countries. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe all the negotiation, and it, look, we're very, very close to what is acceptable. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe that negotiations so far have failed because they have not addressed the utterly pragmatic and essential requirement of Israel and the Palestinians, which is realistic security for the long term. Mm -hmm. And the negotiations, in my opinion, should have been set up so that that would have been in place, provided the centrist groups in both countries, who are the majority, mm -hmm. could come to a fair uh, understanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, what has been suggested in this regard, and I'm only talking, I'm, you've got to bring the negotiation down to Israel and Palestine. Right. If they can come to a fair agreement. It has been suggested that the two countries should be invited to join NATO at the end of the road. Mm -hmm. And further, it's been suggested that there would be strong pressure mm -hmm. on the Arab League to agree to this, mm -hmm. because otherwise they would be in the position of preventing the coming into being of a new Palestinian state. This was not, approach was not taken in any of the negotiations. It, 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 Everyone tried to come in with a total solution. What has been, what I'm suggesting is that you need to have that realistic security at the end of the road, mm -hmm. and then the center can come into power because otherwise there won't be the state, the end, mm -hmm. there won't be the security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you care to comment on this? Sure. Um, I'm not sure why you expect, why, why you see this as contrary to anything I've said. I haven't talked about any of these things. Um, but I'm happy to comment. Um, firstly, I think it's important to recognize that most of the efforts that were made to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli aspects of the conflict between, first of all, there were almost no efforts before 1991. Before Secretary Baker convened the Madrid Peace Conference, there were very few efforts to address the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. President Clinton did briefly, sorry, President Carter did briefly at the beginning of his presidency for the first year, and when uh, uh, Sadat went to Jerusalem, everything shifted to a, a bilateral Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, which was the only thing that was secured in, in consequence at Camp David. So the United States briefly paid some attention to it then, and there was another period earlier. And, 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 second, and, and finally, uh, at Madrid and at Washington and in the Oslo agreements, uh, 
The Palestinians and the Israelis were actually enjoined, prevented from negotiating what were called final status issues for a, a lengthy period of time, which in the event ended up being nearly nine years. All of the all of the really important issues between the two sides, in other words, a package solution, what you described as a package solution, was not even brought to the table until President Clinton convened in the last few months, dying few months of his lame duck last year, the Camp David conference in the summer of, of 2000. So, uh, I, I, and I think that most of what was being done by the United States and Israel in negotiations with the Palestinians in the intervening nine years had to do with precisely what you're talking about, trying to create security. Those, those, those negotiations failed. Those arrangements did not succeed. My point is that I don't really think that the, anybody grasped the nettle until it was actually too late. And it, had it been done earlier, um, there might have been a chance, uh, might have been a chance of an agreement. Professor Haldi. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, yes, excuse me. Um, it's interesting that you made reference to some Israeli historians like right. Morris and others because I was reading a review uh, a couple of days ago in The Economist with regard to one of the books written. I don't know whether it's Morris or somebody else stating that a growing number of Israelis today believe that for a resolution to take place between Israel and the Palestinians, mm -hmm. they need to revisit the actions taken in 1948, yeah. namely with regard to the refugees, whether they escaped or whether they were forced out as a plan of a cleansing plan and so on. Ethnic cleansing. Do you believe that is crucial today, that uh, they should go back to the 48? Uh, is the, do you subscribe to such an opinion? Go back to examining what happened? Yeah. Well, um, I think that the refugee issue is actually the hardest issue to resolve between the Palestinians and Israel. To defer it indefinitely, as was done. Uh, in fact, it was also done at Camp David. They failed, really, to deal with it properly at Camp David, as has been done almost in every single attempt to address this issue or to just sweep it under the rug and say it can't be negotiated. The president, in fact, in April gave then Prime Minister uh, Sharon, in April of 2004, gave then Prime Minister Sharon a guarantee that the United States would support the uh, Israeli position that no refugees can come back to Israel. I think you have to go back and look at it, historically at least. I think it has to be understood that the creation of Israel, the creation of any Jewish state in Palestine in 1948 necessarily and inevitably entailed, had to entail, the disposition a dispossession of a large number of Arabs, and did, in, in fact, entail that dis dispossession. What flows from that is something else. But that, I think, probably has to be recognized, whether in the context of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, whether in the context of something, uh, maybe something that, in some respects, would have to follow a political settlement. But the problem is, in terms of the Palestinian national narrative and where most Palestinians are, which is to say outside of Palestine, this is an issue that has to be addressed in the negotiations as well. How you address it, I don't know. Um, the Arab League just recently had a meeting at which it reiterated its 2002 resolution saying that there has to be a mutually accepted just resolution of this between the Palestinians and the Israelis, meaning that the Israelis would have to accept um, but I really do think it has to be negotiated between the two sides. To simply say, this is out of order, you do, the Palestinian refugees just have to be forgotten, uh, will not fly. No Palestinian leadership that agrees to something like that is going to be, uh, have the confidence of its people. You have to have a referendum on the agreement, and that referendum has to, has to be one in which whatever you agree uh, gets the support of the majority, or it's not worth the paper it's written on. Uh, Professor Kelly? It was working. I think it was. Thank you. <coughs> you. You mentioned an analogy uh, that uh, comparing the Palestinian to uh, foreseeable future to that uh, of Kurds and other ethnic group mm -hmm. in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, in the light of uh, the introduction of uh, Liberman. Man, Lieberman, man. Avigdor Lieberman. Uh, yes, and that, that's not the, in Israel, not in Jersey. Uh, how would, uh, and his view about the Palestinian and the Palestinian solution. Yeah. Do you think this will solidify your point of view, or do you think it will, uh, how would you think, because some of no, the no, newspaper, the question. some of the newspaper in Israel, 
saying that he might be the prime minister in the future. He may. And uh, giving his uh, radical view yeah. to the Palestinian, how would you see the solution of yeah. the Palestinian? Well, um, I mean, some people in the audience may not be as familiar with Israeli politics as you are. Um, the coalition government in Israel has just been expanded by the addition of a party called Israel Betenu, which is headed by a, a Russian immigrant by the name of Avigdor Lieberman, who has expressed some of the most radical opinions of any Israeli politician ever. He's called for expulsion of the Arab citizens of the state of Israel, the, the 1.2 million Palestinians who live in the Galilee and elsewhere. He's called for the one stage in the past. He called for bombing the Aswan Dam to punish his Egypt for something. I'm not sure what. Um, he's a hard, really very hardline character. And my Israeli friends tell me that he is a much more serious politician than many people give him credit for. That he really is quite a serious figure in Israeli politics. Uh, he has uh, eight votes in the Knesset, so he's not, you know, in a position to dominate even this government. Um, but to the extent to which views like that become more prominent, I don't just think it's going to affect the Palestinians. I think it's going to affect the United States. I think it's going to affect the other Arab countries. One of the greatest motors of instability in the Arab world was the creation of the Palestinian refugee problem in 1948. Uh, countries that had just obtained independence, whose state structures were fragile and barely capable of meeting the needs of their own people, had to suddenly, in the case of Jordan in particular, take on huge burdens. Which, which, which weighed them down for well over a decade. Um, and the same thing happened in a, a smaller scale in 1967 when several hundred thousand more Palestinians were displaced. So something like this would cause huge destabilization of the entire region. I, I don't think that it's going to uh, put it this way. If, 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 if our government's tolerance towards almost anything that Israel does extends to letting this kind of thing happen, um, that would be e the height of, ir of, of, of irresponsibility on our part. It would be a very bad thing for the United States. It would be a bad thing for the region, bad thing for the Arab countries. And it would trigger a level of, of, of reaction and hostility uh, that would make what we see today look like child's play. I don't, I don't think, though, that it, I don't think that represents the views of a lot of Israelis. The, the fact is, though, that he's joined a weak government and he is a strong figure. Uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's dangerous, but I don't think it's necessarily as dangerous as, as I made it out to be. Um, I'd like to ask... What were the dynamics that prevented the Palestinians from um, having a state in 1948? Okay, what I, what I discovered when I tried to answer that question as I was working on this book was that the really crucial turning point in terms of the failure of the Palestinians to establish a state in 1948 uh, was their defeat by the British in the preceding decade when they revolted against the British, 36-39, and were absolutely crushed. Uh, something like 14 or 15 percent of adult male Palestinians were either killed, wounded, or imprisoned uh, during that revolt. The entire leadership was killed or exiled or imprisoned. So the Palestinian National Movement was basically broken by the British in the late 30s, and they were completely incapable of resisting in 1948. That's the first thing. The second thing is there was collusion between the major actors on the ground in 1948 to ensure that a Palestinian state did not come into being. The British were determined to prevent this. And so Bevan, the British Foreign Secretary, called in the Jordanian Prime Minister and said to him, we want you to occupy the territory allotted to the Arab state, you, the Jordanian army, the Arab Legion, to occupy the territory allotted to the Arab state under partition. This was back in 1947 that this conversation took place. Israel, or rather the Jewish agency, the, the pre-state government, the pre-state proto-government, which became the government of the state of Israel on May 15, 1948, negotiated with Amir Abdullah, the ruler of Transjordan, to the same end. They agreed that the Jordanians would take over and strangle the Palestinian state at birth, while the Israelis took the area that was allotted to the Jewish state under partition. In fact, um, and, and so there were, there were two sets of agreements between the British and the Jordanians and between the Jewish agency, Golda Meir and, and Moshe Sharat are the ones who negotiated this at, in several meetings with Abdullah. So that was the second thing. The Palestinians were weak and, and had been crushed by the British and really were very, almost, almost non-factors. And the three strongest actors, Israel, Jordan, which had the largest and most powerful Arab army, and Britain, the former imperial power, had enormous influence, um, basically colluded to ensure uh, that there would be no Palestinian state. And, and nobody in the world lifted a finger to prevent this from happening. So, you know, there was collusion and, and then there was uh, indifference or, or uh, worse. Well, my understanding of the facts are a little different. 
1948, Put the Arab, microphone closer to you. In 1948, did the Arab countries surrounding Israel, the new state, attack them? Mm -hmm. They lost. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were dispersed in that, the, that situation. Also at the same time, the Arab nations in the Middle East threw out their Jewish populations. A little later, actually. Not, not, not that much later. <clears throat> and they had a place to go, which was Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, also, is, uh, uh, the Gaza Strip. Sharon gave it back, gave it back with, with uh, 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 an industrial base for them to use, an agricultural base. What they did, they destroyed it. They started shooting rockets into Israel. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, uh, you know, you know, and, and today, uh, uh, today <coughs> the, the democratically elected government vows to destroy the state. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you negotiate with a state like that? Okay, you, you, give me, you give me three really big issues. Let me, let me deal with those three, and then I'll let you give me four and five and six, okay? So we want to talk about Hamas and negotiating with the government. We want to talk about the return of the Gaza Strip, and we want to talk about 1948. Those are each is a, you know, it's like a chunk, a big chunk to deal with. So let me, let me deal with those, and I'm happy to answer any other questions you have, okay? But I, 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 can't, I can't remember more than three things at a time. Let me just go with those. Um, what happened in 1948 is a lot more complicated than you said, and I suggest you read the revisionist Israeli historians, all of whom say what I'm saying. These are not my conclusions only. Every, every respectable Israeli historian now says what I'm about to tell you. Firstly, uh, the, the received version has it that seven or five or six Arab armies invaded Israel. Firstly, the Jordanian army never crossed the frontier between the, that was laid down for the Arab state and the Jewish state under partition. So the Jordanian army and the Iraqi army, which was under the command of the Jordanians, by agreement with the British and by agreement with the Israelis or with the Jewish agency, never, never crossed that line, never invaded Israel. They, the, the fighting was entirely within the area allotted to the Arab state under partition or the so-called corpus separatum around Jerusalem, which was neither part of the Jewish state nor the Arab state. So those are two Arab armies. Two other countries which are described as having invaded Saudi Arabia and Yemen had no regular armies. So No, I'm just going through the seven Arab states. The Lebanese army never crossed the frontier. There were two Arab armies that invaded Israel, the, the, the Egyptian and the Syrian. So... Uh, the two most important actors on the Arab side, which were Jordan and Iraq, were actually bound by an agreement with the Israelis, which, in fact, though the Israelis couldn't necessarily know they would keep it, they did keep. And they kept it not just because they'd agreed with, with Israel, but because they'd agreed with a much more powerful actor, which is Great Britain. As far as the refugees, there is now an enormous body, an enormous body of research on why the refugees were driven out and how they were driven out, and how it was absolutely necessary to drive them out in order to create a Jewish state. In the area allotted to the Jewish state under partition, the Arab population was almost as large as the Jewish. Arabs owned most of the land in the area allotted to the Jewish state under partition. There were, and and there now, there's now even more uh, archival revelations that show exactly how and why uh, what happened happened. Uh, and also show how the Arab states were not even sure they were going to invade in 1948, the ones that did. Uh, it, was, it was touch and go. Let me go to your let me move forward to, to the present, because you talked about Gaza, and you talked about the evacuation of Gaza. Uh, Prime Minister Sharon did two things in, in, in terms of the evacuation of Gaza that were positive. The first is he removed all the settlements. And this is the, this is the underappreciated. It's very important. They, they bulldozed everything there, except, except a couple things, but they removed the settlements. That is to say, they removed the settlers, and they took them out of the Gaza Strip entirely. The second thing that he did was to redeploy the Israeli army out of the Gaza Strip, to the peripheries of the Gaza Strip. And both of these are important things. What he did not do, however, was to allow the, Gaza, the Gazans to have any kind of freedom of movement or action. Israel continued to control the Gaza Strip from without, from the air, from the sea, and from the land frontiers, all of which are under Israeli control. And the result was, whenever it wanted to, Israel would close these frontiers. And in fact, you talked about the, the agricultural uh, the agricultural uh, base that was left by Israel. The, the greenhouses, which uh, uh, James Wolfenson and a group of his colleagues actually financed the purchase of from Israel, uh, were transferred to this private group on the basis of an understanding with Israel that it would allow the export of the cut flowers and of the delicate products of these, of these greenhouses uh, and that this, this transit would not be impeded because it would take place in a way which could not in any way affect the security of Israel. That agreement was, in fact, not kept. 
and the, the agricultural production of these greenhouses just collapsed. A fortune was lost by the, indiv the private individuals whom James Wolfenson uh, put together in a consortium to do this. So again, here the story is, is more complicated. Now you're right about the rocket fire. There has been, before Israel evacuated, by the way, this is not something that started the day that Sharon ordered the evacuation of Gaza. This is something that's been going on since long before, something that Israel was not able to stop when it fully occupied Gaza, and something that it has not been able to stop even with the latest operations, up to yesterday. Rockets were fired after the Israeli army left Beit Hanun. And I agree with you. I think this is foolish, provocative, and in, 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 in my view, self-defeating for the Palestinians. I would mention, however, that all of these rockets, these hundreds of rockets, are wildly inaccurate and have caused a total of two civilian casualties on the Israeli side. What Israel has done, by contrast, um, and I think that this is part of the problem, is to try and solve this by force. Now, you say correctly, the Hamas government, which is the, gov which is the, which is the government that was elected in January and which controls uh, the prime minister's office and, and the ministries, but doesn't control the presidency, which is separate, still controlled by Fatah. So the entire government isn't made up of Hamas. The prime minister and his cabinet are Hamas, as well as a majority of the legislative council. The Hamas government has refused to negotiate with Israel, refused to accept the, the existence of Israel, and so on and so forth. You're correct in that. Part of the, part of the, uh, the problem here, though, is that there are people in Hamas, as is, was shown in May, when the leadership of Hamas in the prisons agreed to a document whereby they would recognize Israel, whether, whereby they would start negotiations. And nobody responded to this. Instead, there was an escalation, even before Hamas started firing rockets or doing stuff in May and June, before the soldier was kidnapped in, on, on, on the 12th of June, uh, Corporal Shalit, the Israeli soldier who was kidnapped in Gaza. There were two kidnapped on the Lebanese border a month later. This one was kidnapped or captured or whatever you want to say. Uh, in June. The problem here is that Israel seems to think the only way to deal with this is force. I would suggest that the way to deal with Hamas is to try and separate those people in Hamas who in fact are pragmatic and are realistic and can be brought into a coalition with Fatah from those who are irreconcilable. And there are actually profound differences between them within Hamas. This is, this is apparent to anybody who studies Palestinian politics. Um, and there has been a refusal to even, even, even approach this on the part of both the Bush administration and the Israeli government. The Israeli, the, Is, the Israeli approach, unfortunately, seems to me to be entirely to rely on force. And I don't think that, I think 40 years of failure of a policy of force and the, the, the limited successes of an attempt to negotiate in the 90s should indicate that you should try and do that if it's possible. With anybody you can negotiate with. Obviously, the people you can't negotiate with, don't negotiate with them. But Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, who founded Hamas, and was assassinated by Israel a couple of years ago, himself said, we would accept a 100-year truce with Israel. We would accept the idea that there would be the two states side by side, and then later generations can settle it. He's not willing to make peace. A 100-year truce is not peace. But I would say, take that up. I would say, follow, it's certainly the alternative I don't think is any better. The rockets keep being fired. Israel is, is killing all these people. I don't think that you're going to deal with it solely by force, frankly. Do, do you have other questions? Yeah, didn't Barack, uh, Uh -huh. Solve the problem, and yet it was rejected. Well, and Barack not only rejected, but they said in suicide bombers, <clears throat> bombers to really disrupt the situation. Again, again, the, the the sequence of events is more complicated than that. Uh, Barack came into office thinking he would negotiate a peace treaty with Syria. For the first period of his prime ministership, he pretty much ignored the Palestinians. When that did not eventuate, and it's a shame because it could. It could easily, I think there, there, was a, there, was, there, was, there were grounds for a breakthrough in 2000, and I blame our government as much as I blame the Syrians and, and, and the Israelis. He then decided he was going to do something on the Palestinian front. But Barack had been a, a, a skeptic of negotiation with the Palestinians since the time he was chief of staff. He opposed the uh, Oslo Accords. He opposed the Y Accords as, as, a, as an army officer. He said that this is not a correct approach. And if you look at the various participant accounts by his own foreign minister, by Shlomo Ben-Ami, or by Ori Savir, who was the negotiator of the Oslo Accords, in other words, critics of, 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 uh, of, of Prime Minister Barak within his own party and within his own government, you will see that he went into that negotiation with a very skeptical, uh, almost, I think, defeatist attitude. And he never made an offer to Arafat. The famous offer was actually an American offer. Barak talked to the Americans, the Americans talked to the Palestinians. Stay with me. 
Uh, stay with me. It's, it's more complicated than the generous offer was rejected. Stay with me. And I mean, I, I, I can give you a dozen books to read if you don't believe me, of participants. What, what thereupon happened was that Arafat rejected the American offer. It wasn't Barack's offer. No maps were offered. Uh, the Palestinians were told this is a take it or leave it thing. This is it. And you have to sign an end of conflict uh, agreement. This is it. You can't raise any issues. And there were all kinds of things that the Palestinians said, we, these need negotiations. And remember what I just said a little while ago. The Palestinians and the Israelis were prevented by the Madrid-Oslo negotiating formula from even talking about settlements, Jerusalem, water, sovereignty, borders, or refugees. They had not even begun to discuss any of the issues between them. And Barack comes along, gives President Clinton whatever he gave him, we don't know, because no Israeli document was ever given to the Palestinians at Camp David, and then the Americans told or read to the Palestinians from whatever the Americans had. And that was it, and they were supposed to accept on the spot. In fact, what then happened was that negotiations continued. President Clinton laid down the so-called Clinton parameters in December of 2000, and by, the, by January, the Palestinians and the Israelis negotiating themselves with American assistance had come close to an agreement. Nobody rejected that agreement. What happened was that the three leaders who negotiated it had come to the end of their tether. President Clinton had been, the Democrats had been defeated in November. President Barack, uh, Prime Minister Barack had lost his majority in the Knesset even before he went to Camp David and was about to lose an election to Sharon. And Arafat, who had 90-odd percent of the vote when he was elected in 95, was in the 20s with his own people by 2000. So all three leaderships had lost their credibility. The agreement was made too late. If Taba had been offered in 91, 2, 3, 4, 5, while Rabin, especially while Rabin was alive, you would have had an agreement. It might have worked, it might not have worked. But in 2000, it was actually too late for reasons that had to do with the domestic politics of the three actors. We can talk later if you want. You can have a fifth and a sixth and an eighth and a twelfth. Let's do this because we've run out of time. Do we have, do we have time?